Theology. Theology. Unplugged. Hey friends, welcome to Theology Unplugged. I am Michael Patton, and today is the question answer session. Sorry it's coming to you late for some of you guys. Maybe you listen to it in the morning, because I get it done pretty early in the morning usually, but this time you're going to have to either wait till the afternoon or wait till tomorrow or Sunday or Monday whenever you're driving to work. Either way, glad to have you. We are answering the questions and answer, uh, or excuse me, the questions that people have. Now, there's one particular question. I, I feel really bad because there's so many, once again, uh, that come from the various places, but there's just one that I've wanted to answer for a long time. And Oh, by the way, watch this. How's that new camera? Which one do you like better, this one or this one? This one is the very expensive one that I've had for a long time since we bought at Credo House to film everything. This one's my little cheap one. I mean, it's not that cheap, but it's one of the better cheap ones. So I don't know. This one goes in and out of focus, and I know that it uses a lot of artificial coloring and stuff. So anyway, it doesn't matter. Which one makes me look more right whenever I'm answering theology questions? That's it. Maybe I can have this one on while I'm looking at this one. So then it looks like I'm talking to somebody and it looks more legit. Anyway, um, one of the questions that I've been wanting to answer, and you saw it in the title, because I put it in the title, you see it in the thumbnail, and it has to do with William Lane Craig, somebody I respect an incredible amount. I mean, just one of the one of the most incredible philosophers that is out there, and not a bad theologian, I've come to find out recently. I mean, it's He's, he's a very thoughtful person. He's going to follow through with the mandate of a philosopher. He's going to act like a philosopher whenever he's dealing with theology. So, And I'll explain to you what that means in just a little bit. But one of the controversies that he's had, he always has many controversies, but they're never, they're, some of them are benign and some of them maybe are a little bit more. And this one was a, one of those that was a little bit more that I had to dig into a lot more to find out exactly what was going on. Now, I still don't know what's really going on, but I want to explain, I'm going to use this as a springboard to explain something that I explain or, or is taught in Christology, in any Christology course, doctrine of the study of Christ, just the person and work of Christ, whenever you're talking about the person of Christ, who he is, um, and and the relationship of his humanity to his divinity and his divinity to his fleshly nature, uh, and what is his divinity, divinity, defining his divinity. We're going to, we cover that so much in this, in this through theology in a year, but it's coming up later or in the through theology in a year that I go through during the week. By the way, if you guys want to join us, we're on session. I'm getting ready to start session number 60, which is Bibliology and Hermeneutics. I'm starting a brand new, a brand new session. I guess I'm going to start calling these seasons maybe. Somebody suggested that. So season one was introduction of theology. Season two is going to be bibliology. Maybe season three will be hermeneutics, and I'll just go in that direction. That way you can find them easier and that you can know where where to place everything. But either way, um, Christology is one that's coming up, and this one has to do with Christology, the doctrine of the study of Christ. And it's a – William Lane Craig seems to be questioning – um, a, oh, I mean, here, here's the thing. You and I, we've talked about this, how important tradition is. We've talked about how important the history of the church is. We've talked about how important the Vincinian canon is. But I've also talked about how it is that we often see our tradition and build it up too much. Like the little book of tradition that starts very small and is just the Apostles' Creed gets larger and larger and larger and larger as controversies arise. So as these controversies arise, we feel the need in church history, in tradition, to... to um, uh, to uh, <laughs> Sorry. Uh, to answer them. To, to answer every single one of them because they're kind of... It's just like this is the new question on the stage. And at one point, you have just the question of who is Christ in relation to the Father, which is probably the most important question there is. Christ said, who do men say that I am? I think that's the most important question on planet Earth. Always has been, always will be. Who, who do men say that I am? 
And so whenever you're talking about this, this is still talking about the same thing, but it's getting into some minute details of who Christ is. And that's the thing that's hard, and that's the thing that's you don't want to get too detailed. You can you can say very briefly what Christ is, who Christ is in relation to the Father, that he is he is very God of very God, very man of very man. He is homoousios with the Father, meaning he is of the same substance, the same stuff. They share the exact same nature, not the same kind of nature, the exact same nature. But whenever it comes to Christ's humanity, we've got to ask the question, if he is fully God, fully God, uh, or excuse me, very God, how is it that he's very man? What does it mean that he's very man? Now, at this point, we begin to define what man is, what God is, um, and, and start to get really detailed because questions come up as you move in to this issue. Now, if, if you're going through church history, what you'll find is you'll find a sincere people, not some of you won't like me saying this, but you have sincere people like Apollinarius and Nestorius, who I think, you know, we'll talk to in heaven. We'll see them in heaven. They were doing the best at the time with the information they had, and they were trying to answer the question, in what sense was God or Christ man? How much was he man? And so people would come up and say, okay, well, wait a minute. Here's the divine logos. You know, as John says, the word of God, here is the second person of the Trinity and he becomes man. What happens? Does he enter into a man's body? That kind of thing where you've got this kind of God in a bod. So you have, if you think of this guy named Apollinarius says it must be, you know, he just, he has a human flesh, but he has a divine soul. He has a divine mind. His mind is still completely divine, and it's just on the outward, he looks like a human. Now, that was a valiant attempt. It really was. I'm not saying that, you know, it was anything really good. It's just the first step, and her- we need heresy. We need, we need um, controversy to create clarity, and this, or contrast to create clarity, and what I mean by that is contrast to what is true. So something comes up and he says, I think Jesus, Apollinarius, in you know the second, third century, and he comes in and he says, I think Jesus was just uh, God in a bod, basically. He had the human flesh and he had the divine soul. And people came up and said, no, that can't be right. That doesn't make any sense. And he's, you know, why not? They said, well, because if he's God in a bod, if he only has a human body, then on the cross, we only have our bodies represented. We only have our flesh, our skin, our flesh and blood, those things that you're talking about. But we have a soul. We have a spirit, whatever. We have an, let's just put it this way. We have an immaterial part, whatever that immaterial part is. We, I mean, it's made up of a soul, a spirit, a mind, all three of those are immaterial aspects of our being. So we have those. Were those not represented on the cross? Was the human soul, spirit, and mind not represented on the cross? Because if it wasn't, then those are not saved. Um, as as uh, the Cappadocian fathers would say, what is not assumed has not been saved. Christ had to assume every aspect of who we are in order to save every aspect of who we are. So they said, Apollinarius, you're a heretic. Set aside. Like I said, I don't think you can really call him properly speaking a heretic because if you look at what he was doing and you know hear from him from the other authors it doesn't seem like he was a he wasn't like Arius who was denying Christ's very deity that Christ was created but he was just doing making a valiant attempt in the progress of our understanding of theology that was the first one it wasn't really the first one. There was all kinds of smaller ones that came, and but I'm just giving you the big picture here. And then another guy comes up and he says, "Okay, if he's not God in a bod, if we he has to be a hundred percent man, everything that we are, so that he could represent everything that we are on the cross, then uh, let's put it this way: he has a human nature and a human or a divine nature, and he has a human person." And a divine person. That's the new that th- this was called Nestorianism. 
Uh, it's it's very debated whether Nestorius himself, the guy that uh, this is attributed to, ever held to this, but some people did. And some people, you know, even today maybe hold to it, where you've got basically this these two persons walking around in one body, the divine Christ and the human Jesus. Christ and Jesus both together and kind of take in their roles as they go. Like maybe whenever, whenever Christ is healing, he's using uh, the divine Christ. But whenever Jesus is, uh, you know, hungry, that is the human Jesus. Whenever he is walking on water, that is the divine Christ. But whenever he doesn't know something like the time of his coming, that is the human Jesus. So he kind of switches back and forth, which creates a really, really odd situation. You've got this multiple personality at best. I mean, at very best, a multiple personality. But in the end, you don't really have anybody that can represent us because you have two people. You need somebody to be fully God in order to bridge the gap between us and God. And in order to bridge that gap, you have to have somebody that's fully man, somebody, not some people Otherwise, he could have just come up and partnered. I mean, it's not like Jesus came down and went in a body and talked to, or Christ came down and went into a body and was talking to this guy named Jesus. And he said, hey, I'm Christ. And Jesus said, hey, I'm Jesus. It looks like we're going to be working together for a while to try to save you, redeem humanity. It wasn't two people. It's one person. One person, two complete natures. 100% God, 100% man. Now, having said that, that's a very basic understanding. There's one more that came up a little bit later. This was at the Sixth Ecumenical Council. And at the Sixth Ecumenical Council, uh, you have a in, in the in the seventh century or the sixth century, you have another situation where we've already defined Christ as being fully God, fully man at Chalcedon in three or excuse me, in uh, 451 AD, 451 AD, a council came together. It's called the definition of Chalcedon. That's where we, we the creed or the definition was written um, that Christ is fully God, a fully God, fully man, a fully man. Done. Now you have another problem later on. They said, well, what about the, what about the will of man and the will of the divine? Don't they both have a will? And if they both have a will, what what happens to their will? Does it unite? Th- let me ask. Let me say one more thing because there is one more important thing. There was a there was a view called Eutychianism that came in and said, okay, they both came together in one body, and they just kind of they just kind of uh, united, mixed together. Eutychianism. That's called also called monophysitism. Uh, one nature, monophysitism one physicality. So you have uh, one nature that comes together and just mixes. And so it's a brand new nature. Now, what's the problem with that? The problem with that should be immediate because if he's one new nature, what was hanging on the cross? You have the human and the divine coming together and making a humine, humine. Now, how many people are humines here on this earth or have there ever been any humines on the earth? The earth? You'd say there's zero, Michael, no humines whatsoever. I'd say then how many people could that humine named Jesus Christ represent on the cross? So, well, I guess none because there was none to represent. You see what I'm getting at? You just, there, there's really, it's very difficult to say how this happened, what happened. Oh, we're, we're saying at this point, what didn't happen? Wasn't two persons in one body? Wasn't the divine mind just coming into a human shell, um, uh, you know, the God and the bod, and it wasn't this mixture that came together, this new mixture. So you have a new problem, which they say, what is the will? Whenever you have the will of Christ come down into the will of Jesus, what happened to the wills and which one was controlling you see, if you have two wills there, the thought was, well, wait a minute, if there's two wills, then um, you do have Nestorianism, which is two people in one body, you know, because what is a will? That's the question. What is a will? And so you try to define the will, and if you define it according to the person and say he has two wills, then you're saying he has two persons. So this was the problem. But having said that, 
the Sixth Ecumenical Council came together and said, no, he has to have two wills. This is called monothelitism. Uh, one, one will, monothelitism. So you have monothelitism come and win, win the day. Any idea that he had, or excuse me, I'm so sorry. What am I talking about? <laughs> you, you have, you have uh, the one, monothelitism being condemned because if you have two wills, then again, you have this mixture that comes together. So here's the situation you walk into. You're saying, okay, Michael, then what is he? How, how do we define him? And I would tell you if I was starting out, I mean, I, whenever I teach on this, this is what I'll tell you. I say, this is where we come into apophatic and cataphatic theology. We know what he is not, but it's harder to say what exactly he is. And if we go too far with saying what he is, we'll probably end up in some type of heresy. That's what always happens. Whenever you over-define theology, you end up in some with some type of problem at least where it implies a heresy. So this is the situation that William Lane Craig comes into. Historic Christianity, I mean, Protestants, we accept the first, we accept the uh, first four councils, if we could put it that way. The first four councils, most Protestants, all Protestants should by definition, accept the first four councils. It's been a little bit more difficult to say everybody accepts the sixth council and denies or even even wants to go in the direction of the Sixth Council and say, I, I don't want, maybe we want to say, hey, I don't want to define it that far. Most Protestants would probably say, though, that the, mon, uh, the two wills that were defined in the Sixth Council is the best we can do. So let's go ahead and say two wills and leave it at that. Don't push it any further. We don't know. There, there are two wills, but there was not two persons. Two wills, but there was not two centers of consciousness. There was two complete natures, whatever those natures are, whatever that is necessary to make up those natures, which we don't understand human nature that much. I mean, even today, we don't understand it. So whenever we're talking about all the aspects of human nature, there's great debates on what is the immaterial, what is the material, do we have body, soul, spirit, do we have body, soul, spirit, mind, do we have body, soul, spirit, heart? I mean, all of these immaterial aspects that we often use language for, it's just placeholders for what is right. It's not saying this is right, but it's good enough placeholders. It's good enough placeholders. Um, we think we have this kind of analogy of being with God to be able to point in the right direction, even if we can't point perfectly in the right direction, just like pointing at the sun. You may have, you may have a bunch of people pointing at the sun, and you're all generally pointing in the right direction, but if you draw a line from the end of your finger all the way to the sun, guarantee not one of them will even come close, not even within thousands of miles. But we're still pointing in the same direction, generally speaking. So that's that's kind of the attitude I think we need to take with many of these issues in theology, especially, especially whenever it comes to Christology, especially whenever it comes to Trinitarian theology. We keep this mystery open, okay? We don't overdefine. Here's what it's not, here's what it is. I just say, here's what I say you're safe with. To complete natures, whatever is involved in those natures, they're, com they're complete. One person. Now, here's the question now, Michael. What are you defining as a person? Because obviously you're not saying the person, the center of identity, is combined or, or is attached to the nature. Now, this is where this is where the William Lane Craig thing comes in. And He's been accused of all kinds of things, of uh, monophysitism, monothelitism, uh, mixing the natures, uh, mixing the wills, having uh, just all kinds of problems, right? To where, you know, from their standpoint, if you do that, our wills are not represented on the cross because you're mixing them together. So here comes Greg and he says, well, here's what we're going to do. I don't believe, and he's a philosopher. Remember that he is a philosopher and that this is always as, as somebody who d stays in theology for the most part, I love the philosophy. I really do. 
We have to have philosophy. But as a philosopher, primarily a philosopher, he's always primarily had the mind of a philosopher, even though he's incredibly smart with regard to theology. He wants to push the envelope. Philosophers can't really deal with paradoxes or seeming contradictions. Contradictions, yes, we do not, no, none of us should abide. But whenever it comes to paradoxes, things that we just can't push any further, such as, you know, how did God create everything out of nothing? You know, a philosopher might drive themselves insane trying to figure it out. And I might kick back and say, listen, you're never going to figure that out. That's a mystery. There's some things that are just in the hands of God. You have to leave it there. Philosopher will keep on pushing. And I love philosophers for doing it. I really do. Because the, it's the philosophers that sometimes help us find out how far we can push it. And unfortunately for the philosophers, there's sometimes the ones who end up on the wrong side of the line that help us define the line. I'm not saying William Lee Craig is doing that in the sense of like, I'm calling him a heretic. Not at all. I don't think he is. A lot of you all will be upset because I didn't call him a heretic because a lot of people, it's, it's, it's fashionable right now to call him that. Um, I don't think you can do that. I, I, if you read his stuff, here's what William Lane Craig has done. He's come in and said, listen, I think there is one center of consciousness. Good enough. Yeah, I get it. One center of consciousness. And that, whenever, I, whenever I define this, folks, I'm doing the best I can because we're moving into some areas that are, like I said, I don't like, I don't like trying to figure out. I don't think we should. I don't think we should push it. So I'm trying to describe how he thinks he's figured it out, uh, at least to some degree, and how people say that he's walked into heresy. He has said that the divine mind, the divine logos, which is Christ, comes in, and that is the only center of consciousness and the only will. Okay, so there's only one will. So the will of Christ has come in and limited itself. The one will of Christ limited itself, limited his his uh, ability to, uh, his knowledge, his, his omniscience. He has limited his power, limited every aspect of it to the human abilities to a human's ability. So if you take a human will, how much can we pull off? The divine will has come in and said, that's all I'm going to pull off, right? I'm just going to shape myself in that direction. And if I go beyond that, then I can't represent them because I've pushed myself too far. So there's only one self, one will. That's the way he's defining it. And you may say, what's the matter with that? Well, remember, the Six Ecumenical Council has come in and said, no, you can't do that because there has to be two wills. In the Six Ecumenical Council, monothelitism was condemned. And generally speaking, like I said, Orthodoxy, Roman Catholicism, and most Protestants have moved forward saying that's good enough. I think it's overdefining. I really do. I don't think I don't I don't even deal with the Six Ecumenical Council. I mean, I, I know about it. I, I read it. it it's interesting. And I like that they did this in a sense, but I don't like that they defined it in orthodoxy in such a way. This is where they really began over-defining things. Maybe really, the Fifth Ecumenical Council, I think they began over-defining things. And then after the Fourth, everything starts, the book starts to get too thick. The creed starts to get too long. And here they are saying there are two wills. So what are they doing whenever they say there are two wills? They're connecting the will with the nature. They're saying a will is inherent to the nature of a being. God has a will in his essence. Man has a will in his essence, which in, in, in a very real sense is true, but you're, you're trying to define that and you're trying to say, well, what is a will whenever it comes to Christ? If you define will according to the nature it's hard to figure out what that is. And it's hard not to look at that and see, well, if there's two wills, aren't there two persons inside of them? Two wills, two, two, uh, not, not two wills that are the ability in each person, or excuse me, each nature to make decisions, but the actual decision-making itself. If those two are there, then don't you have two persons? Two hypostases is what they would call it. 
And then you would say, well, I don't know. I don't know whether you tie a will to the person or to the nature. If you're tying it to the person, he has one will, period. I mean, there's no question. If you're tying the will to the nature, then he has two wills. But you're going to have to figure out in each case what is a will. And I don't think anybody can go there. I I personally would say whatever, this is the best I would say, is whatever it is that makes up a human, every aspect, every component Christ had in its human form, unconfused, not mixed together, not separated to where they're, you know, two persons, but working, it's it's coming together and it's fully God, fully God. And so you have those two natures and then you only have one person, one center of consciousness that is driving. You see what I'm saying? One center of consciousness that drives Christ. And so if there's one center of consciousness that drives Christ, is that center of consciousness, does it draw from the will of each or does it have a will of its own based upon the inherent nature of what a person is? Now, I know this is so hard and so confusing, especially for those of you who have not been through Christology yet. Even one of you go through Christology. I'm telling you, this is not easy stuff. This is why, why I like, hey, guys, listen, back off. I mean, back off on defining it too much, over-defining it, being too dogmatic about any of this stuff, because I think we're all saying the same thing. Because whenever I listen to William Lane Craig, I mean, he will not deny in any sense that he has to be everything that a human is, unconfused, undivided, and everything that, a, uh, that God is, that the second person of the Trinity is, unconfused undivided there what was there was there a new person introduced at that moment whenever christ was conceived was a new person that had never existed was that introduced you say well if it's on the human side if the person is on the human side then yes if the person is on the divine side no so does the divine come in and energize this, this human, new human, and then kind of inform it on what to do? Or does the divine come in and take over the, the person on this side? Or is there two persons? You see, it gets so it goes beyond what we can do. And that that is, I, I'm being totally honest with you. I don't like it whenever you go that far. I really, really don't. I know I keep on saying that, but it's like there is a mystery at some point. This is why I emphasize so much throughout the Through Theology in a Year in Prolegomena, the acceptance of cataphatic theology and apophatic theology. We we pursue and pursue and pursue, but also accept it's a mystery. Everything we encounter in life is a mystery. Everything we know about this earth is a mystery. Everything we know about the human cell and life itself is ultimately a mystery. And why, why do we think we can overdefine that? Why do we think we're qualified? Why do we think we have we we can push the envelope that far? We'll push it, you know, throughout all eternity with God, but at the same time, it's it's something we've got to tiptoe. I remember Calvin talking about uh uh, excuse me, uh, St. Augustine talking about the Trinity whenever he started discussing the Trinity. And he said, there's no place any more dangerous right now for me to be than talking about this. I'm scared, basically. That's what he said. I'm scared. I got I to gotta tiptoe around this and be so careful. And I don't think we're being very careful at this point where we push things that far. I don't think William Lane Craig is being very careful. I don't think the Sixth Ecumenical Council was being careful enough. I think it should have stopped at the fourth and that we don't go any further after that. You get what I'm saying? If you ever ask me, do I agree with monothletism or duothletism, two, two wills, I'd say define the will for me first. Tell me what the will is and tell me what it is in relation to the person. And I guarantee I'll push it with you to a point you don't know. And then I'll say back off. 
That's what I'll say. Back off at that point. So that is my current stance on my understanding of the William Lane Craig controversy that is called, if you wanted to look it up, Neo-Apollinarianism. And I think he's actually calling it Neo-Apollinarianism as best I can. He looked it, I looked it up and it's on, you know, Reasonable Faith website and it's called Neo-Apollinarianism. I don't know why you would associate it with Apollinarianism. I mean, that's already the God and the Bod heresy and it's... It's defined as that. And then you're like, Neo got in the bod heresy. <laughs> you can't define it according to heresy. Just introduce something else. And I don't know. Like I said, don't even deal with it. But that's, that is, I'm, I'm going to say this one more time. I, I'm sorry for pushing it so much. That is the philosopher's dilemma. William Lane Craig has all these fringe problems that I see where he pushes things too far because he can't, he can't back off of the mystery. And say, we can't really go any fur- further. And I love him for it. And I say, listen, I'm not going to go there. I can't go there. I don't think you should. But I love you for it. <laughs> I love you for going I- across the into enemy territory into the, and getting beat up, getting shot, so that I know where the shooters are at. So that is that is that question that I've been asked many, many times. And I needed to answer it. I know this took so long. And you pr- probably, I don't know whether I contributed at all to your understanding of number one, what the issue is, and number two, how to solve this issue. But I did my best. It's a tough issue to try to cover in 30 minutes. We will cover it a lot more over many, many sessions after we get to Trinitarianism and define God for a long time, define our worldview, and then we can walk into that kind of stuff when we're defining Christ. Okay, let's see here. There is another question that was asked by Jeff. He says, he, he's talking about, uh, I, we, we've been going through, you know, creeds, and just like the creeds that I talked about, the Nicene Creed, its update in 381 at uh, the Second Council of Constantinople, and then 451, the definition of Chalcedon, not creed of Chalcedon, but definition of Chalcedon. So we really have one creed, which is the Nicene Creed, and then we have this kind of addendum, which is the definition of Chalcedon. And he says, why doesn't, uh, why don't many churches uh, use these creeds? So he's looking at it and he's saying, man, these creeds are great, and they unite us to 2,000 years of Christianity. Why don't we as a church why don't we stand up and uh, speak them and recite them and and say them to one another? Uh, a lot of churches do, Jeff. A lot of churches do. I mean, a whole. You know, if you're talking about the the more traditional, the more high church, high churches, more formalized, more kind of built up by tradition of the past. Low church is that kind of really, really informal that you just start a church and you preach out on that, you know. Uh, out under a uh, tent and you do things completely new high church will normally like a like a lutheran or a anglican or or a uh, presbyterian reformed lots of those churches will have these creeds recited and it's great it really is because like like i think you're thinking it connects us to the past it's a great thing for us to know low churches usually don't Low churches are still, at least in concept, in rebellion against tradition. And so they say, listen, tradition has led us wrong in the past, so we don't have any creed but the Bible. That's actually kind of the Church of Christ motto. No creed but the Bible. The problem is, what, what's the problem with that? That's a creed. So what if you say no creed but the Bible? That's a creed. Okay, you've already done it. It's been going on for a long time. So it's been said many times. So you've got a new creed, and you can't really escape having tradition. And there's no reason to want to escape having tradition. Just because it's, just because it can and sometimes does mislead us. Just because sometimes it lead it, it it points us in the wrong direction, and we go there and we get beat up. That doesn't make it bad. It's very important for us to look to creeds. And I would love it if low church, at least people with low church mentality, would start at least introducing some of this stuff. I'd love it if high church mentality would start just kind of breaking free from stuff. I mean, there's got to be a meeting in the middle, you know, and mixing things up. I remember a pastor of mine, Mark Hitchcock, used to say, 
I, I, I'm not, I don't know if he does this that much, but he used to say, I like to change things up. You know, you get in a pattern of doing things a certain way. And he says, I like to change things up randomly all of a sudden just to break people free from their traditions and get them uncomfortable. And so you're going according to a certain, you know, uh, routine, a certain liturgy at your church. And then all of a sudden you say, you know what, today we're not going to do any liturgy. We're just going to do things this way. And you change it all around. Well, what does that do? That keeps people from getting too attached to defining church according to the tradition, defining their faith according to that tradition. But at the same time, instead of getting rid of all tradition, it just kind of keeps going the same thing, just breaking it up every once in a while to shock people's spiritual muscles. And that's what I would call it, shocking your spiritual muscles. So yes, Jeff, I think everybody should should have um, the creeds. I think they should have church history. I think this is a essential part of who we are, everything. It's just wonderful. Okay, let's see here. Let me find the other question. Um, sessions going through the theological process. No, that's not it. You had a conversation. I'm Excuse me, I'm sorry. I should have had this more ready. Um, Okay, this is a good one. Uh, Brendan says, I don't know what to say to this. This is this is another one of those deals. I mean, this is all going to be the one of those places that we just can't enter into. But Brendan says, um, it, we, we believe that the space is expanding. We believe that it's always expanding. It's eternally expanding. That's one of the things that modern science, at least, has told us. And then it says, um, God rested on the seventh day. Since the universe is expanding, nothing more. So God creating is God creating empty space for the universe to expand into? So there's no more material being created. God rested on the sixth day, or the seventh day, excuse me. He stopped creating on the sixth day. Is there is he creating empty space? But on the seventh day, I have thought that something like this was growing, but presupposed the empty space to grow into. I, I don't know. I really don't. I mean, I don't know how you deal with the, uh, even the idea of space. That, like I said earlier, the most basic fundamental things that we deal with uh, every day, we don't understand. And so whenever you're talking about space and you're talking about something like this, I've always thought, okay, space can't go on forever. It's impossible. I mean, you just think of it, you can't have an ever expanding space or not expanding, just a, a space everywhere and it never, ever stops. That doesn't make any sense. We can't comprehend that. If it is true, we can't comprehend it. And then you stop and you say, okay, well, what if space stopped at some point? Well, what happens whenever you get to the edge of the universe and it stops? I mean, do you put your hands on it and like, can you get a chisel and start chiseling into it, make it go a little bit further? What's behind it? What is it? Does it just stop? And I do think that this is only going to be solved by an understanding of some sort of dimensionality. I mean, I think there's, we have no idea about how dimensions work and what we are, what dimension we're in and how this dimension functions. If it's ever expanding, I don't know. I don't. I can't answer these questions. These are the things that I back off, and I think it's a good one. Though. The reason why I say it, Brennan, is because I, I think it's just another example of these things that we have to just back off. We have to say, see law the theologically. We have to say, just rest. Celebrate what you have. Stop at some point. Now, it doesn't mean we're going to stop forever. I mean, like I said, in heaven, we're going to be eternally learning. Maybe we'll get more information once we get there, but I think there's a limit, and God has put that limit in purpose, I mean, uh, in place for a reason, and that that limit helps us to, to really understand the mystery of God and how, how great He is and well, the wonder of God. And I, I do love that word whenever it comes to theology. It's just see law, stop. See law, rest. See law. This is enough. See law. You know how in the Psalms, you know, sometimes at the end it says see law. It's basically saying, think about that. Stop. 
Don't go any further. Just think about the wonder of what was said. And I think we have a sea law capacity on this earth. I mean, there's just some things we're not going to be able to get. Okay. Uh, let me see here. I think I can find one more question. I'm so sorry. I should have, I should have had this more prepared, but I mainly in my mind was getting ready for the William Lane Craig question. And that was what I was prepared for. Let me see if I can fill up the time on this microphone to find where I had the other questions. Okay, I think I found it. No, I didn't. <laughs> okay, no, seriously. I'm a goofball, I'm sorry. I'm a goofball. I am I am a knucklehead sometimes. <laughs> okay, guys, uh, that, that's it. That's all we're going for today. Sorry, uh, those of you who I didn't get to your questions, but I do feel like I needed to cover the William Lane Craig thing. We will see you next Monday as we continue through Theology in a Year, and hopefully by that time I'll be able to begin Bibliology and Hermeneutics, or Bibliology, Season 2, Bibliology, because... I'm trying to get prepared for that. There's so much. I haven't even got the design done yet. But anyway, see you next time. Theology 